Dear friends, as you know, we are excited that so many choose to come and we really decided that we wanted to let almost everyone who wanted to come actually be here, which also means that we have a full house. So please move up front. There's a few seats left, second, third row. There's one seat left right there. And people keep thinking that the first rows are going to be more expensive, no they're not. And, or that they're going to be reserved, no they're not. They're reserved for you, ma'am. This seat right here. And now that I got your silence, we can do as we usually do at Forest. We can start one minute early because we're excited about the future and we want to get there first. And I can't even begin to tell you how excited I am about today. Because, and I think I speak for the whole Swedish eco environmental green movement, I've been brought up with the World Watch Institute yearbooks. The State of the World, Tillstånd i världen. For many years, that was published in Swedish by Naturvårdsverket, and that was like a yearly Bible. I used to be in pol politics myself, and then in green movements, and whenever we had a debate, I would always bring up the state of the world and say, this is how it should be done. These are the great examples, and this is how disastrous the path we are on are, and this is how easy it is to change. So now actually having World Watch Institute here to do their presentation in Sweden about their World Watch state of the world, can a city be sustainable here at Forest? That's just so ex such exciting times, and I'm so glad to have you here. Which also means that I'm going to be brief. I'm going to be speaking first, but I want to just get over with this and so we can focus on, on, the main, on the main speakers today, which is World Watch and also Nord Regio, with whom we're doing this together. Let me remind you that when you do tweet or Instagram or whatever you choose to do, please use hashtag Fores and State of the World 2016, but we abbreviate it to SOW. 2016. This is uh, broadcast on a YouTube channel, which means that there's a lot more people than we actually see here that are going to be following us, which also means that whenever you feel like, yes, I do want to come and please wait for the microphone so that the people who are following this, be it in Washington or Mumbai or Lixele, can also hear you. And first, so can a city be sustainable? Yes, we decided so already. Uh, last autumn, I think we all followed the Paris Agreement. I was there myself. We were actually presenting at Forest how we can have a fossil independent transport sector. But at least as important last year was that the whole world agreed on the sustainable development goals. Unlike the previous Millennium Goals, these are not just for the developing countries. These are for every single country of the world and all the countries have agreed to do so. Amen. And number 11, it says sustainable cities and communities. And when you sort of double click on that one, if you go to the website, you will find all the individual targets on how to get there. And here in Sweden, like in most countries, we were already setting up working groups and national targets, how to reach all of those targets. My favorite here probably is number 17, people keep missing that one, is partnership for the goals. And that's what Forest is all about. We're a partnership for the goals. Not just these goals, but goals also on um, economic development, on a better integration, better migration. But when I speak about sustainable cities, top of mind for me has to be climate change. We know that the climate has been changing for thousands of years, but we also know that it's never been here before in terms of CO2 equivalents in the atmosphere. And you know that last, uh, the last few days we've been discussing that April was again another month that was warmer than ever before. And we know that if this correlation holds true in the future, well, temperature is going to go up again uh, more than ever before. And this is where we are with business as usual, unless we manage to do at least what we pledged in Paris and probably much more. So can a city be sustainable? Yes, it, it has to, and it has to focus on many issues, but not least climate. And of course, it's, it's, a, it's a tough target, because for a city like Stockholm, where we got the equivalent of two big uh, blue, blue linear bus uh, of people moving into Stockholm each and every day. So when we discuss how, we how to become sustainable, it's a moving target because there's more of us every day. And that, of course, is also true on a global level. A few years ago, we reached the threshold where mo most people actually live in cities. By 2030, when we'll meet here again and when f Sweden is going to be totally fossil independent in the transport sector, six out of every 10 are going to live in cities, and by 2050, seven out of 10. So it's going to be rare in the future to not live in the city. So this issue that State of the World uh, brings up is very pertinent. 
this brings up opportunities because we see that those 50% living in cities, they only occupy 4% of the global area in direct terms. But then we know that the indirect term, the footprint of us living in the cities, is just growing larger and larger, partially because less and less of what we require is actually in the cities. There's less and less green space, less and less production or of food and other issues. So we see that it looks small, but the shadow or the footprint is very big. I want to bring up a few issues or topics that I would love to discuss more perhaps here, perhaps in the following roundtable in a smaller group, or perhaps in different o other occasions. So how how important is it to be efficient and what is really efficient? We know that this is what's happening in Sweden right now, that many people, it's a movement that's really happening where people say, hey, I want to put solar on my roof. Uh, that's also a very strong component of the German Energiewende. House by house by house, people are saying, hey, I want to be part of the solution. But we know that that's not very efficient. In fact, you can actually see that the sun is up there, so it's not even towards the sun, it's towards the people. And we know that it's not going to be super efficient to go house by house. This is what's super efficient. This is uh, fully commercial. It's done in Morocco. It, do it doesn't need subsidies. It makes business sense because it's so damn large and because it's at one place. When I went to India in December to see their solar revolution, I was at first disappointed. I didn't see any house with solar on the roof. But then I discussed it with them and they said, well, we're not that inefficient. We don't have the money to be that inefficient. We put big stuff in less places and we get a much more cost-efficient translation. But on the other hand, if people are more excited about this and not so excited about this, perhaps we have to go for this anyway. We see the same, there's other example, you know, urban gardening, I'd say is probably not the most efficient thing to do. I love those entrepreneurs that did, did be urban with beehives in the cities, but is it cost-effective? I don't think so. Green roofs, are they cost effective in the cities? I'm sure they're not. But uh, perhaps they are anyway, because they make us want to do it. And perhaps that's something that we keep forgetting when we discuss what is the most efficient thing to do. One thing I know that we often forget is that when we came home from Paris, we realized that we have to mitigate, we have to reduce climate emissions. But we also have to realize that climate is already changing and we have to adapt to that. And the Paris Agreement says that those two things are equally important. And then when you look at how the Green Climate Fund is spending its money, it's spending the money on both. Mitigation and adaptation, but almost always one or the other. And in Sweden also it's usually one or the other. And in fact, it's worse. You go down to Slussen right here. You see, how is Slussen dealing with adaptation with rising sea levels? By putting more concrete. What about concrete and the climate? Well, concrete is about the worst thing you can do for the climate. So we're getting more emissions by adaptations. And then you see in some cities like Krihuansta, they realize that these two things have to go hand in hand. It's no, it's no wonder that Krihuansta did this because it's the lowest lying city in Sweden. It's four meters below city, uh, sea level. So they realized, hey, we got to adapt, but when we do that, let's do that with wetlands and let's use the barriers that, have, that we have to build. Let's do them in s by soil instead of by, rather than using concrete. And let's put elevated bike lanes there so it becomes more attractive, more beautiful to bike. So we get people to bike, that's good for the climate. We put up trees rather than concrete, that's good for the climate. So you get those things to go together. But nationally, policy-wise, no. That's not happening. Internationally, policy-wise, no, that's not happening. Can a city be sustainable? Yes, but only if adaptation and mitigation go together. And adaptation also has to go together with living. This is an example from Sri Lanka. They realized, hey, we need to get ready for worse floodings in the future. Uh, and, and so they built all these emergency shelters. But there hasn't been all that much of the flooding yet. It's going to come in the future. So those shelters became very expensive to maintain. And some of them were are starting to fall apart already. So then they decided, hey, let's use these as schools. Let's build all these emergency shelters as schools. So you combine adaptations with things that you need to do anyway. Back to the Kufransta example, they needed to do more bikeways anyway. So they combine adaptations with more bikeways. Win-win. And 
lastly, because I really want World Watch to get up here, so my last slide is that I think that we and World Watch and Nord Regio and so many others should come together and find a best global practice for uh, sustainable cities. I see that this has often sort of fallen in between the chairs or in between the tables because often government think, well, cities, that's local municipalities, let them decide for themselves. And many cities don't really have that global outreach so they can find the best alliances or the global best practices. Some of the things that I would love for us to work on is best public transport. This is the BRT system of, of uh, Latin America and Southern Africa where you can much faster uh, than we have been doing go from independent or individual car usage to, to quick buses and then in the future other kinds of public transport. This is uh, Chicago uh, where uh, the green roofs are not just done individually one by one. This is actually the city council that they decided we're going to do this on thousands of roofs and we're going to do it in a way that really reduces climate impact and get us a better air for the people to breathe. This is not really any city, but I want to show that the connection, the ultra-fast connection, uh, uh, megabit per second, is much more relevant to the inhabitants of Hong Kong already today than kilometer per hour in public transport or in a car. And we're going to get there everywhere when we realize that a sustainable city has to be a city where it's easier to transport yourself through the megabits per second than through the kilometers per hour. And finally, and I know that World Watch is going to discuss this uh, much more deeply and they've got wonderful examples, how do we make this a participatory uh, process? How do we get the people involved? One of my favorite examples, I'm Swiss born myself, so I know that in several places of Switzerland they still raise their hand and meet at the square to discuss, but that's easy to do in a small society. But then you go to uh, Porto Alegre in Brazil, and realize that even in a city of more than a million inhabitants, they actually are able to ask the citizens, what do you want to spend your taxes on? How much tax are you, excited, are you excited about paying? And where's your big no-no? I don't want any tax money to be spent on this. So when they manage to get this kind of citizen information and dialogue with the cities on such a difficult issue as taxation, with all the different spending areas. I'm sure that we can find a way to make citizens a part of uh, uh, sustainable uh, cities. I would love now to hand over briefly to Marcos, my uh, dear colleague who heads the uh, Milieu, Climat Milieu Energy Program here at Forest and who's going to lead us for the rest of the day and who's going to introduce World Watch. Marcos. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Matthias. Can a city be sustainable? Your answer to that was, was yes. In, uh, in this year's uh, State of the World, the World Watch Institute lists two underlying principles to support sustainable cities. Uh, number one is good governance, uh, powerful leaders. Uh, number two is, is uh, citizen engagement. And this is sometimes discussed in Stockholm. It's said that Stockholm citizens wake up late when it comes to large-scale proje pro projects. You mentioned Slussen here. Uh, five to 12 people wake up and say that, no, the, the suggested solution for, for Slussen is a bad one. We want a, a different one, but it's too late. When it comes to other projects that's closer to you, or uh, uh, not least closer to your wallet, uh, you wake up early and you protest. People are, uh, are positive uh, towards new houses in general and, and towards new houses for, for, for immigrants, but not here, not in my backyard. Is, is there a problem, Matthias, that uh, it's easier to engage people in certain issues than in others? Yes, I do think so. so that's part of why I'm so excited to hear from World Watch how to deal with that. Absolutely. And why did you stuff your mouth with a sandwich <laughs> right before the question? <laughs> <laughs> Only Leif Givi Persson can do that. <laughs> we, we switched to World Watch Institute and, uh, and Stephanie Loveless. Uh, your book is available at least as a, uh, as a PDF, is that correct? Mm -hmm. But you can also order hard copies yeah. if you want. Yeah, from the, from the American office. Um, and yeah, I suppose people could probably just contact me about that. 
was the microphone on or uh, is it nah. on now? We, uh, if if you're interested in the book, please let us know. Please. Is it on now? No, it should be on. Okay. Good. Stephanie Loveless from uh, World Watch Institute. Thanks, Marcus. Is the microphone working? I think I think I can hear it. So yeah, guess we don't need that one. Um, thank you for the introduction, uh, and also for inviting me to speak on behalf of World Watch today. Um, well, the authors um, by writing this book. Oh yes, are we? Yes. yes. Now we have my slides up. <laughs> um, by writing this book, the authors are acknowledging um, some of the challenges that we face today, particularly when it comes to things like climate change and rapidly urbanizing and a rapidly urbanizing planet. The book was meant to offer hope and give a toolbox of ideas for how cities might not only meet the targets set in the Paris agreements, but how they might take a holistic approach for creating sustainable cities. I hope to share with you some of the examples from around the world that might inspire you when putting together your toolbox for your own sustainable cities. But before I delve into the book, um, I want to set the stage. I want to do a visioning exercise with you, and I want us to try being present together. So I want you to be present here in this city with me today. I'm going to say this wrong, but I want you to be uh, present with me here in Sodomam, in this very building. Since we're in Sodomam, there's a good chance that we're near old buildings uh, that are relics that have survived Stockholm's era of demolition. I even read that in this neighborhood, some small-scale pre-industrial buildings can still be found. Perhaps some of you can attest to that. Well, I want you to think about, in particular, how people planned and built Stockholm in the past with their values, economy, and events of the day imprinted into the city we know as Stockholm today. I think it's important to consider how the cities we make today and the values we impart on urban landscapes will last into the future and will impact future generations. Now that we know where we're at, we're here in Stockholm together, we can think about where we want to go and how we want to make our sustainable cities. The book focuses on a number of themes that many of you may be working with in some capacity or another already. And perhaps there are also some themes which you haven't considered working with today, uh, w working with yet, that after today you will consider working with. So what is a sustainable so city? Well, one of the questions that the book seeks to answer is, um, uh, sorry, the book seeks to answer this very question. So if you just take a moment, you probably all have your own version of what a sustainable city is. Perhaps you also have the working version, um, the version you use for your organizations and your companies that you're involved with every day. At the, basics, at the basic level, we know that cities are built by people for people, that they include an economic, environmental, and social aspects. But what happens when you bring sustainability into the mix? Well, the, books, the, the authors of the State of the World 2016 book define it as the following. A sustainable city is a vibrant place where people live with plenty of opportunities of all kinds. They live in harmony with nature and the environment. Um, offering the ability to create dignified lives for all citizens. So how do we create these sustainable cities? Well, the book also offers seven key principles to sustainable cities uh, that go along with the themes. In particular, they're based on addressing human needs, physical structures, and the natural environment. 
And while reading, I found there were many examples that as to opposed to focusing on purely economic or environmental aspects of cities, there were many examples that focused on the social aspects, social inclusiveness, and people-centered development. And based on the examples from the book, it seems like there's a lot of untapped potential in utilizing a people-centered approach for long-term and holistic planning of sustainable cities. As you will see in the examples that I'm presenting today, they, have, they include elements of social cohesion, um, uh, inclusion, social justice on the one hand, but on the other hand, they also uh, demonstrate a range of co-benefits so getting more than one benefit for the people-centered solutions. And I know that we're here in Scandinavia today, uh, that we're here in Sweden, but the book highlights examples from around the world. So I wanna share with you examples uh, from all over the planet, and I hope that they will inspire you. But I also, wanted to, um, I also want us to keep in mind that urban development is very context-specific. So while the, there's no cookie cutter way to make a sustainable city, these should serve as um, inspiration for your sustainable city toolboxes. The first example I wanna share with you today is Freiburg, Germany. Probably many of you know of Freiburg, as I have somebody nodding in the front, as um, having a long held history uh, focusing on sustainability. In fact, since the 1970s. Um, in Freiburg, sustainability is understood as including not only the environment or the climate, but it's also about social affairs, education, and culture. As an, extens as an extension of these, um, these values, in 2012, Freiburg decided to focus on five policy areas, including social justice, as one of the main priorities. As part of this, one of the things that they did is they made an, a sustainable education fund that's accessible for all in order to teach sustainable education practices and to teach citizens about how to live sustainable lifestyles. And as Matthias probably touched on, as many of you who are working in urban development might be um, grappling with today. Freiburg also took up the example um, of, how to, of how to approach displacement of low-income residents. So they recognize that housing for low-income residents is threatened, and to avoid this displacement of citizens that leads, rise, uh, that, that leads to um, a rise in housing prices, prices and also segregation, they promised since 2013 to build 1,000 new apartments each year. And not only do they build those apartments, but they do it using the highest of green building standards, 30% higher than the German, German national average, in fact. Another example I wanna share with you today is Vancouver, Canada. They're highlighting people-centered development in a number of ways. And it, um, they also have, since 2011, a Green City Action Plan. So if you're interested in um, citizen engagement, you may want to actually check out how Vancouver um, got input from up to 35,000 citizens using um, social media, online tools, and face-to-face um, -face workshops and events to get feedback on how they want to develop their, their action plan. You may also be interested in checking out Vancouver because they have 75 quick start actions for how to get going with sustainable cities. And not only that, Vancouver aims to create opportunities today while building a strong local economy, uh, vibrant and inclusive neighborhoods that meet the needs of generations to come. And they also, say, uh, they also set out to create more green jobs. One of the ways they do this is by supporting a burgeoning local food movement and food industry. The city also, one of the unique things about Vancouver is that they also prioritize any solutions for sustainable, uh, sustainable cities that involve co-benefits. So if you have an idea that kills two birds with one stone, you're much more likely to get funding for it. 
One of the very one of the really interesting examples of this is um, the way in which the city is supporting uh, urban agriculture programs like Soul Foods. I have a picture of a woman working for one of these Soul Food farms here. There, these the farms created by Soul Foods. Um, they're actually um, they're training people who might otherwise have barriers to employment, and they're locating uh, vacant lots in the city in, in which to create these urban farms, and then they're selling the produce. The co-benefits here include local, accessible, healthy food, greening of, of the city, and job creation, not to mention the range of other benefits that urban gardens provide. I also want to just briefly mention a few other really inspiring examples from the book uh, of inclusive urban development and people-centered development. Um, so one of the, again, hopefully these will inspire you and give you ideas for your sustainable cities toolbox. One of the examples that was inspiring to me is Pune, India. They're using a participatory, participatory budgeting scheme. So they actually give a, su a sum of money to particular neighborhoods and they allow them to dictate what they want done in their city to revitalize their neighborhood and to create a more sustainable neighborhood. Another really interesting thing that they're doing is they're taking um, waste pickers who have been a traditionally marginalized group and they're recognizing the importance that waste pickers have for their cities, for recovering materials and for recycling. And they're actually working them into um, their official waste strategies. And finally in Poon, they're creating a, sen a center for citizen citizenship and environmental education where they're creating representatives and environmental stewards for the whole city, and they're even extending this to school children. In Barcelona, Spain, perhaps I'm a little biased because I get to move there in September, <laughs> but um, in Barcelona, Spain, they're using green space, and they're using lots of it uh, to support urban biodiversity. They're also using it as a way to address climate change um, or to prepare themselves for climate change, and to support a number of other um, initiatives where they can connect citizens with urban nature, because there are many co-benefits in that as well. Um, I also want to mention Portland. I tend to think of it as, um, as the Copenhagen of the USA. And again, I'm biased because I live in Copenhagen. But um, they have a comprehensive urban sustainability program. But now they're taking it a step further. They're doing something really interesting with life cycle analysis. So what they want to do is they actually want to measure emissions generated through consumption in households, public agencies, and business. And then they want to share this information with the public so that citizens gain a better understanding of how they contribute to emissions. Um, just a couple other brief examples. In Durban, they have a community-based ecosystem adaptation program where they're actually training people in the cities to be environmental stewards. They're training them to grow trees, to remove invasive species, uh, to restore riparian banks, and collect recyclable materials. In turn, those people who have been trained and are providing these services for the city, what they get is they earn credit that they can trade for building materials, they can trade for food, for household goods, and even for school, uh, school fees. And so far, the program is showing early signs of success. And finally, perhaps one of the really, it, there's so many co-benefits to this example, but in Medellin, Colombia, um, this city is working on a really interesting inclusive transportation and connectivity scheme where they're introducing uh, hydroelectric metro cable cars uh, to districts that are poor and formerly inaccessible to the rest of the city. There are also interventions to areas around the metro cable stops that are, um, and, and, and in these uh, interventions, um, that is, they're, sh they're shaping the metro cable stops to, for example, have places to sit, to have different services for people. And they're doing it using um, partially a participatory budgeting scheme and also using local labor. That's part of the deal. They, they do highlight that um, in order to achieve something like this, it takes national and international instruments to support um, this form of an ur urban cohesion policy. But what are they seeing in terms of benefits? Well, they're seeing an improvement in squatter areas. They're seeing a reduction in crime. They're seeing improved air quality, reduced emissions, um, 
and they're also seeing uh, it's actually creating a tourist attraction, of course, who wouldn't want to see a hydroelectric metro cable car? Um, and best of all, these areas are now connected. So what do these examples have in common? Well, they're people centered they're focused on people centered development. They have broad definitions of sustainable development. It's not only about economics, it's not only about the environment, it's about people and many other things. They also include long-term plans and initiatives rooted in social, um, environmental, uh, economic, and, and economic sustainability targets. They're also embedded in national and municipal sustainability policies. They encompass inclusion, social cohes cohesion, justice, and social change. They include many co-benefits, as I've discussed throughout the, uh, as I've shown throughout my examples. They utilize both top-down and bottom-up strategies, and in the end, actually, people-centered development it does actually uh, encompass the seven principles outlined in the book for achieving sustainable development in cities. And since I have a few more minutes, and because I live in Copenhagen, I just wanted to give a little reality check, um, a, a, more of a reflection after reading the book on my view of the city. And Copenhagen often is voted um, one of the happy, or Denmark is often referred to as one of the happiest countries in the world. Um, people often look to Copenhagen as this um, best sustainability uh, example. Um, but I wanted to share a little bit of the reality on the ground in Copenhagen. Copenhagen in 2013 launched, um, they launched a bike sharing program. And it was basically touted as being the next big thing for sustainable transportation for residents. But um, today, <laughs> we actually see that the program is days away from being scrapped, so it's basically flopping. Um, so 40 million kroner, or seven and a half million euro later, why is this happening? Well, some people think it's because the city actually un misunderstood locals' needs. Instead, the program is expensive, and it's turned into something that is more appealing for tourists. Why would residents want to use something made for tourists? or that they perceive to be made for tourists. I also want to talk about green space in Copenhagen. Um, a friend of mine, actually, she's been doing some research at how Copenhagen grand, brand, has been branding itself as a green city. <laughs> and, um, well, in fact, she found that they focus more on sustainable transportation and green economy and less on physically green infrastructure, which we know has so many benefits for citizens. I like to think it's because of her research, but there might be pressures coming from other places as well, that now Copenhagen has actually decided to implement an urban nature strategy um, to capture some of the co-benefits of urban nature. And something else really interesting uh, in one of the, the urban garden pictured here is um, that I actually happen to be personally involved with is that there is um, there are roughly 40 citizen-led urban greening projects um, so what we see here are new governance arrangements, co-governance, as you will, of urban spaces. There's even more projects that want to be registered officially. Finally, oh no, not finally, two more examples, and then I will get to the last slide. <laughs> um, as many cities in Europe do, Copenhagen incinerates our waste for energy. So what have we done? We've spent half a billion euro to implement a premier architecture firm called Biggs um, Waste Incinerator, and it has a ski slope on it. Sounds fun, right? I'm not sure I would pay to use that, but I guess it depends on the price. <laughs> um, that's something to think about. But the question also begs, does requiring a constant stream of waste to feed this thing promote renewables and waste reduction? I'll leave that one with you guys. And lastly, I just want to point out that in 2014, WWF actually calculated that Denmark is one of the fourth, fourth is the fourth biggest consuming country on the planet. So, how are we doing in terms of consumption? We could probably do better. Well, after reading the book, many questions remain, and I'll leave you with a few of them. How is sustainability defined, and according to whom? 
How can a people-centered uh, approach be realized in your cities? How are we impar imparting our beliefs onto future generations? How can we measure our impact of our actions today? And finally, how do Nordic urban sustainability efforts impact global sustainability? I hope these questions help you dis uh, us to continue the discussion throughout the day. Thank you very much. Stephanie, thank you. You said that in a in a sustainable city, the lives should be it should be uh, dignified lives for for everyone. And uh, and then I I wonder how your life and my life might be good, but but how 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 do we how do we know what the poor people, the uneducated, the, the immigrants, what, what they want and their needs? Who will listen to them? Uh, we should listen to them. <laughs> Actually, uh, you know, we define sustainable cities from a place of privilege. And I think we need to recognize that in this room, uh, we have a certain degree of privilege, also influence in how we create our cities. But if we actually want to know how we can better serve mar marginalized populations, then actually we need to open ourselves up and listen to them. Yep. Thank you. Thanks. Next in line. Next in line, Sandra. Mm -hmm. Sandra Oliveira e Costa from Node Radio. And when we met early this morning, uh, we realized that Sandra was, uh, is, is a former student of mine yes. as well. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Today, you will present New Radio's work in this field. Uh, your talk is called Nordic, Nordic Trends and Examples of Inclusive Urban Planning. Yes. What should be included, how and why? Mm -hmm. Okay, Just thank you, Marcus. Uh, yes, my name is Sandra Oliveira Costa. I'm uh, happy to be here today. As the new radio is invited, and as we have the possibility to be part of this in interesting discussion. Um, yes, I will talk about inclusive uh, urban planning from a Nordic perspective, and get in briefly to some uh, what's uh, going on in the Nordic region, and give some um, very brief examples on this. Um, yes, well, I can say something about my background as well. I'm a human geographer, former student to Marcus, <laughs> uh, among uh, others. And um, I've also worked with uh, urban planning in uh, the municipality of uh, Göteborg, Gothenburg. And I've been focusing quite a lot on uh, citizen participation. So, what is Nordregio? It's a Nordic center for um, uh, spatial development. It's a research institute, and we um, focus on uh, uh, research with uh, policy relevance for regional development within the fields of uh, demography, maritime spatial planning nowadays. And um, let's see what more should I say. Well, also um, innovation strategies, for example, and of course urban planning. And within urban planning, lately we have been uh, doing research about uh, segregation, participatory approaches, and partnership in urban planning, among other things. Uh, we are funded both by the Nordic Council of Ministers and of uh, the projects that we are working on. Let's see if I have some water over here, yes. This is a map that shows uh, which are the um, regions within the Nordic region that have that do accommodate the most part of the urban population growth. And I think that uh, Matthias gave us an introduction talking a bit about the challenges that not only urban region, of course, but we all um, standing for. And um, it's uh, quite remarkable that as much as 97% of the population growth is occurring in um, some specific part of um, the Nordic region. And it's, of course, the, the urban regions. And we all know about, for example, the 
housing shortage in Sweden and uh, uh, the challenges it poses to, uh, um, not least to planning. And I think that also the introduction we've got from before shows that uh, many of the issues concerning sustainability is uh, uh, regulated more or less within uh, uh, planning processes. And uh, since we have uh, all these um, very um, complex uh, problems to work on, which I think uh, we've got an introduction uh, to earlier, we, uh, it's um, um, quite a big consensus that we need to be many actors working together to solve problems. So even if uh, uh, it's uh, common with a uh, municipal planning monopoly in the Nordic countries, the different actors, um, not least the pr private actors, have come to take a bigger role in the cooperation with municipalities. We see a lot of demands to plan uh, faster and more efficiently, not least to uh, respond to these uh, housing uh, shortages. And... Uh, to be more efficient, we have this uh, big debate going on about that we need to, to shorten the, the planning process, which is not the whole side of the story. There are uh, also uh, discussions uh, going on about that the building companies need to take responsibility for housing being built and so on. But uh, there is a belief that with, with the cooperation in early stages, both with the private sector, but also with citizens and NGOs, we can work on difficult problems in early stage, and that will uh, make us respond. I mean, that will make that um, problems do not uh, occur very late in these processes to be solved later on. But uh, being... Uh, efficient? Is there any contradictions to being democratic and having participatory engagements? Um, some criticize that when uh, uh, we have uh, formal channels for um, private companies to be part of processes of developing the city, then um, the democratic influence of citizens become um, less. So why then include citizens in urban planning? I don't know if you can see this graph, but I can explain it a little bit to you. It's, um, I think it's uh, quite interesting. One of the arguments that is often uh, coming up for including citizens is that the membership of in uh, political parties is shrinking quite a lot. So we need to have other ways to have this um, democracy between elections since people are not in general as much involved in political parties as before. And this graph, I think it's, uh, you can hardly see it here, but it shows that the Scandinavian countries have had um, higher membership than other European countries in political parties and that has also uh, decreased uh, more dramatically. Another um, argument for including uh, citizens in um, urban planning processes is to uh, strengthen the knowledge among the planners themselves to be, as um, you um, finalized the last presentation here, how should we know about what the local uh, people want in an area, what are their needs. So this is uh, different kinds of dialogue arrangements and participatory arrangements. It's also a way to get to know more about the, um, the inhabitants' needs in a place and also get to know what, what are the possibilities here. Um. Another thing that is commonly stated is that participatory arrangements such as meetings with uh, inhabitants, and talking about the, from the municipality side, but also uh, private building companies are doing this quite a lot. To have different kinds of forums or uh, meeting in uh, various uh, creative ways, doing workshops together or, or whatever, that this will uh, increase the social capital in a local area as well, both because um, people meet each other from the local area, but also when they get uh, contact with uh, 
uh, the municipal authority get more uh, a bigger social uh, network. And um, of course also that um, also connected to this uh, graph here, not everyone is uh, participating. Um, I mean, there is inequalities on who is participating and influencing the development of society today. And these kind of approaches, um, more inclusive and participatory, can give the chance for more marginalized groups to also take part in influencing society, such as low-income groups or um, uh, lower-educated groups that don't have the same kind of power in society. And then we also have the, um, there is a higher um, demand on participation since uh, due to the lot of the uh, quantity of information that we have in society nowadays. And this picture uh, shows a couple that uh, signed a petition for voting about infrastructure, uh, infrastructure project in Gothenburg. So, um, cooperation is not uh, necessarily easy. Um, working with uh, many different actors is, um, takes a lot of time. And um, even though uh, many say that it will, will give uh, more positive solutions in the long run, it also takes a lot of dedication. And what we see is that there are uh, models being uh, developed to approach uh, different ways of doing uh, um, planning in a more cooperative way. The Södertörn model and Baltic Urban Lab are two projects that No Regio is uh, participating in. The first one is uh, eight uh, municipalities south of uh, Stockholm that together with uh, universities and private actors are uh, testing new uh, ways of working together. In Baltic Urban Lab, we are following uh, Norrköping, Riga, Tallinn and uh, Åbo in um, their development of brownfield areas, former uh, harbour or industrial areas, and uh, how they are working with uh, involving different stakeholders. So these are projects that uh, will give some results uh, further on. And on the picture here, you can see a cooperation model that was uh, developed by Malmö. Um, they were doing a regeneration project in a specific uh, area, and here they have uh, identified different uh, platforms and tools, and also prerequisites that they find to be important to be successful in cooperation between different stakeholders. Then, um, Lillestrøm is another example where. Uh, one of the results of uh, um, this more um, participant or like partnership participatory arrangements um, was a, a forum where they gather politicians, um, public authorities, and the private developers of the municipality to have this ongoing uh, fora for discussion and dialogue. Um, there is a big quantity of methods being applied around the Nordic uh, countries today. And uh, here I just wanted to show a couple of uh, uh, digital tools that is being uh, developed, but are also being used today. Um, maybe some of you are working in these cities, I don't know. Uh, this is from Göteborg, it's called My City, and this is Norrköping. Let's create Norrköping, it's, uh, the tool is called City Planner, I think. And what you can do here is that you can, anyone can access through the web a visualization of the cities, and you can get some information about what's planning is going on. And you can also leave some comments, and you can draw some lines or draw some objects here. Um, Anyhow, this is, uh, I think it should be said as well that these uh, kind of tools uh, are, uh, are or can or maybe should be used as uh, complements to other face-to-face -face methods. Um, and uh, even in, uh, also in, in Finland there is a, a similar tool uh, developed that is called Mapsioner that is used by different municipalities. And uh, it's also this kind of creative tool which everyone can access to create um, information on the development. And of course, it's not only developing new areas or 
uh, where uh, citizen involvement is uh, important. We have a lot of uh, big housing stock and, and uh, housing areas in um, the Nordic countries and also in, in other parts of Europe that was built in the 1960s and 70s and that is now under uh, uh, renovation and we have seen many examples when it's uh, um, important to involve uh, citizens for this to be made in a way where uh, it can be acceptable for everyone. Um, Nordega is also actually going to work with a project that uh, has to do with these issues, this social green project with different countries in Europe. Um, yes, I'm getting to the end. I just wanted to say that inclusive uh, planning is uh, often framed as one uh, aspect within social sustainability when talking about developing cities and other um, themes that used to be uh, framed as social sustainability questions are such as segregation, equality, issues on equality, the children's perspective and where they should uh, play and have a place to um, exist in the compact city and so on, also accessibility issues and so on. And there are some interesting examples going on now in Sweden, I think, that is worth, worth to mention as well, which are the social sustainability commissions that started off in Malmö and then uh, took place also in Göteborg and now in Stockholm, where many different actors together are working on analyzing and uh, coming with uh, um, suggestions on how to uh, work with inequality issues, issues within the cities. So, um, just to say some more maybe general final words about this, that we see that many Nordic uh, cities work ambitiously to involve uh, actors in planning, both uh, making private, public and private partnerships, but also participation from NGOs and citizens. And I think that uh, one of the obvious points with these kind of events is actually the learning between uh, cities and uh, the Nordic countries are not, uh, they have their uh, differences of course, but still we have a lot to uh, learn from each other since we have a kind of similar conditions anyhow. Yes, thank you. Sandra, thank you. C can I ask you to back a few slides uh, to that where you see uh, citizen citizens' partners in urban planning? That one, yes, that one. And r related to this, are all urban development issues suitable for public participation processes or not? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, and I think it's a, it's kind of a brave question as well because uh, um, I think in ma in many of these um, kind of forums we, we tend to talk about citizen participation as, as also being at al as almost being something um, unproblematic as if citizens themselves also always. Uh, stand for um, very like like justice I ideals, for example, um, and I think that uh, um, it's important to also see that we shouldn't like rom romanticize over the citizen as being um, the most uh, just uh, person in all occasions. I mean, the, the group of citizens is uh, like us all. There are all kinds of uh, opinions and um, political ideals and, and so on. And I think that one example when this is quite clearly showed uh, recently in, in Sweden is when um, we have the um, um, situation where we need to build uh, lots of housing for everyone and uh, not least for uh, refugees that have uh, um, uh, residents in, in Sweden and we have seen quite severe protests against that. 
Um, and um, I th this, um, like, one argument that I didn't talk about, but for including citizens is also the um, social justice argument. Uh, and sometimes um, I ask myself if, if the municipality is maybe the one uh, that should take this kind of uh, uh, statement, actually. Did I make myself clear? <laughs> when I see this, this picture from a, a petition for voting about an infrastructure project in Gothenburg, I come to think about the root hole, uh, when they were building root holes a couple of years ago, when there was, uh, in Gothenburg, there was uh, a, a strong uh, research support for it, politicians wanted it, but there was a lot of protest for, uh, f from, the, from the citizens, or at least from the car driving uh, part of the citizens. Uh, people wanted less traffic in the city, but they didn't want to pay for it if they were, were driving. Uh, can I ask the rest of you to come, uh, not all of you, <laughs> Uh, but uh, Matthias and Stephanie, please to come up on stage as well. Yes, hello. I'm gonna do you. Yes, I can do like this. The, I, I'd say that the timing of this seminar is very good. It, it's not thanks to us, it, it's, uh, it's more thanks to World Watch Institute. A couple of days ago, Dongas Nyheter. Uh, had a had a a, a a special issue or uh, uh, on uh, city city planning. Uh, they spent the f the full uh, uh, paper discussing what we're discussing here. Th uh, was uh, last Sunday, uh, three days ago. Today, when opening up the same uh, newspaper, you can read about uh, uh, citizen engagement and people s uh, stopping. Uh, what they c consider expensive investments in in in, in, uh, in their houses and necessary. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, uh, I, I'm not the one to, to say. To the panel, uh, are there any free lunches? <laughs> we, we just had one. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I didn't. <laughs> I missed yeah, it. I only had four. <laughs> uh, we want. We, we want to uh, drastically reduce CO2 emissions. We want good living standards. We want the uh, city to be socially inclusive. In the same Dagens Nyheter, I read an article uh, about a project in, uh, in Malmö, Sege Park. Their answer to, to reducing the CO2 emissions is, is not only new technology, but also reducing the... Uh, the uh, the living standard or the, the area in each apartment with, with some 20%, which is a lot. Which is a lot, especially when people are asking for more and better houses. So, again, uh, in, that example, in that example, I would say there, there is no free lunch because you, you get your reduced CO2 emission, but you get also a reduced living standard. To you, are there free lunches in building a sustainable city? Um, I don't know if you, is the microphone working? Yeah. yeah. So okay, I, it doesn't look on, but um, I think something that, for me, that you're touching on is this idea of degrowth, which um, the book actually touches on at many points, too. Um, how can we think in terms of um, using fewer resources? How can we think in more, um, in terms of lives li uh, lived in more confined units, so denser cities, spatially, also living with fewer things, consuming less? Um, so I actually think that that's a really important conversation. And I, I don't think that we should have the same standard of living in many cases, especially for people who have already been very privileged um, I think we, we could certainly do more to try to, let's say, equalize standard of livings between, <coughs> excuse me, low income or marginalized populations. And um, let's say, yeah, those of us who are privileged can leave it there. Mm. Sandra? Yeah, I think it's uh, very important to talk about those uh, conflicts in uh, like making uh, cities uh, sustainable. Sometimes the social sustainability concept is a little talked about as if... Um, 
uh, we could get those uh, free lunches, as you talk about, that we everything can work out in the best way for everyone. And I don't think that's... Uh, possible and uh, we need to talk about what's um, like w what is political in different uh, solutions who is uh, gaining and who is uh, losing whatever solution we're ever uh, coming forth with there will always be uh, conflicts and there will always be um, negotiations done and I think we need to be open about this and not uh, make it look as if um, uh, solutions we are coming forth with don't have inherent uh, conflicts in them. I think uh, not only are there sometimes free lunches, but I guess the obvious answer would be no, there's no free lunches. Yes, but there is. And sometimes it's even better than that. Sometimes you get paid to eat lunch. <laughs> and one of my examples of that is Malmö Kommunala Bostäder, which is a dear partner to us here at FUES. Now, Malmö Kommunala Bostäder, uh, they had a lot of, uh, of damage being done to, to their housing in Rosengård and, and other areas. And so they decided to include the local community in renovating. First of all, the cost went down, because it's cheaper to ask people to do stuff with themselves. And then second, the damaging went down very much, because people said, well, that's my neighbor who built that fence, so that's my friend who built or painted that wall. So it became cheaper all the way through the process, and it also became a much more attractive area to live in. Now, when I see those, those cities, and I love those examples that you brought up, of, of, uh, of cities and, and municipalities trying to get a better community engagement, um, be they Porto Alegre, like my example, or Zurich or Colix, uh, at first it looks expensive. And at first, it looks like it's not rational. People want to, there used to be a not in my backyard syndrome. There's now a yes, where my neighbors can see it approach. I insist on having solar panels, but I want them on my own roof, not somewhere else. And I want them in the front, even though it's not the best location, because I want the neighbors to see it. Now, that's not going to be very efficient, so then it seems like the lunch is not free at all because it's going to be much more expensive. But then when you factor in all the different costs and you factor in long-term community engagement, the lunch is not only free, it's been paid for. Uh, <laughs> yeah, come on. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Uh, uh, yeah, okay. okay. Th there might be examples yeah. uh, uh, like that. I live in, a, in, a, in an area in Stockholm where most of you you would fit in rather well. People look the same, and they are they engaged. You you you, uh, you vote for the same party, and they wear the same clothes. And we are engaged we, we, both in the environment and in 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 our uh, in other citizens. But we also are we're not that concerned when the uh, alcoholics moved from that area to a neighboring area. I mean, I, I have to admit. I mean, I have three kids. I. I if it's better for them playing with other kids w w than with a uh, with a man usually sitting in the, uh, on the bench, uh, I, I found an article uh, a couple of weeks ago in uh, Nya Värmlands Tidning. Uh, we want to drink uh, in peace, uh, uh, and th this was a very odd uh, uh, article in a, in a newspaper. Not very often. The, the, the old man on, on the park bench drinking beer uh, have their say. So we, me and my pals are sitting and drinking uh, outside uh, Johansson's uh, hot dog stand. <laughs> the, the, the police comes and, and, and uh, ask us to leave. But we prefer to sit there because there is a nearby toilet. <laughs> they they, yeah, they either sense. take us home to the police, police station or ask us to go to this other place where there is no toilet. The, uh, the, which it's worse for all, they say. Uh, first of all, uh, I mean, reading the headline was just a funny article, but I think this p points at what, uh, at least some of the issues w that we discussed here. Uh, also, I came across an interesting research uh, project at the uh, KTH, the Royal Institute of Technology. And uh, is this on? And in, in, in English, the, the research project is called uh, uh, The Evil City. And uh, Josephine Wangel from uh, uh, KTH, Royal Institute of Technology, is, is here. And uh, uh, I got very curious, and I don't know m more about this project than a, than a poster that I read uh, in the corridor. Can I ask you to, to ask you, is The Evil City 
<laughs> a neighbor of the sustainable city, or is it the same city? The evil city. Uh, I would say that the evil city and the good or sustainable or attractive or vibrant or smart or whatever positive connotation we want to attach to the city is essentially the same. They are layers of the same place, of the same people, of the same resource flows. Uh, the reason for why we started a project called the Evil City was because we thought that we would find other things than what you find when you look for sustainable cities. So we explicitly wanted to identify uh, the shadows, uh, the dark side of the, not the moon, but the sustainable city. To see all of these marginalized people, uh, the alcoholics that aren't allowed to drink uh, in the suburb centers, uh, the homeless people who cannot sleep on park benches anymore, uh, the people who are living in an even more segregated city just because the city is investing in sustainable urban development. Uh, we wanted to identify and address, address all of these paradoxes because of course you can have a free snack or it might seem free, <laughs> but someone have produced that snack and probably under working conditions that doesn't taste so well. Uh, so we wanted to get another, yeah, well, another angle of, of how we are used to think about cities as promises uh, rather than problems. So, so there might be free lunches for you and me, but Steve and his friends, they, they had to move to, to give us that lunch. Yeah, and you know, millions of, of workers in China uh, have severe health problems so that sustainable cities in Sweden can be built with sustainable materials, i.e. stone, uh, to costs that aren't perceived as unaffordable. Just to provide another example. And with that, with Josephine, we open up the, the floor for, for other questions. Uh, you raised your hand, and we tried to to, uh, to pick as many as uh, as possible. And you, uh, a question uh, is started with uh, presenting who you are, and it, it is it is a question, and it is short. <laughs> or we <laughs> take the mic back. <laughs> now, Parabenius is my name. Yeah. What about uh, what uh, Matthias told us? Uh, previously that uh, all big cities will be flooded in a few years. Was that to Matthias? Uh, I didn't really recognize myself saying that, but, uh, but uh, the rising sea levels is a, is a big issue, and how we tackle them really shows whether we mean sustainability or whether we just talk sustainability and I see that when we look at those cities that have been flooded in the past if you go to New Orleans the way they prepare themselves for flooding in the future is not impressive in terms of sustainability at all so I'm still looking for somebody who really and Krufansta is probably my favorite example of somebody who really understands that how preparing for for flooding can be done in a sustainable way Krufansta Krufansta Skeone well, I was mentioning it briefly in the, in the beginning, they are below sea level, so the, the way they're, they need to put up walls, and they've been putting up walls for centuries, but they put up walls not by concrete, but by using earth and using uh, wetlands and using trees, and the walls they need to build, they're using as bikeways. Hello, my name is Lena Bailu, I come from E.ON Sweden, the energy company. And uh, I just uh, have, a, it's not a question, but please let me comment anyway on Stephanie, you, uh, when you uh, showed the picture of Copenhagen and the big new incineration plan. It's just, just to remind uh, ourselves that we, it's us, we, the people that are creating the waste, it's not the energy companies, and we have to take care of it. Of course, we should minimize the waste or we should reuse it, but some of the waste will always be needed to uh, be incinerated, and unless we want to put it in landfill, landfill that is even worse. So that was just a comment about the waste. So it's not only 
a bad thing that we are creating big incineration plants. I just wanted to point out that there is actually a mention in the book, though, of, um, I, I think it was in Germany, people actually needing to import waste to continue incinerating. So, um, yeah, we may mm -hmm. not be creating all this waste or we may need some waste, but should we really be importing it as well? Yeah, but yeah. by importing waste, you might create an enormous big climate um, way and change. But it well is being in imported. Less in unless other, p other countries put it on land wa landfills, the waste on landfills, if, you, if we import it here and take care of it in a sustainable way, it's even better. Okay. Wait. Christina, are you leaving? Because if you are, I'd like to th throw a question to you. <laughs> Christina Schaffer at, uh, uh, from Stockholm University. Uh, and it's... Uh, directed uh, to you because of something Matthias said uh, a while ago. Uh, something like ur urban farming or uh, uh, be urban or whatever examples are used. Is it cost efficient? Probably not, you said. Christina is engaged in, uh, in urban farming and or guerrilla farming or what you call it. Is it, is it cost efficient? Uh, hello, uh, I don't have any calculations on it, but uh, what, to put it simple, it's, uh, uh, it contributes with uh, uh, it's, it's m with multiple benefits. So it's not only about food production. It co co depending on which uh, agriculture method and uh, size of the garden or yeah, type of garden, it can contribute with so many other values. So let me put it differently. Is it worth doing? Uh, yes, of course. Thank you. Another free lunch, maybe. But it's not, uh, it's not the solution to, of, uh, uh, to produce uh, food sustainab sustainable in a sustainable way. We still need uh, countryside and farmers and all that. So, and so don't forget that when talking about sustainable cities. Don't forget that. And is that a follow-up on, on what Christina said? Okay, then we can s s we skip the line and give the microphone to... Yeah, uh, my name is Åsa Hildestrand, and I just uh, wanted to come back to that question, or what you said about uh, the countryside and the cities. And uh, and the first, or the, the main question today was, can a city be sustainable? And it would be interesting to hear your views. Are you still of the opinion, or I think many people seem to be of the opinion, that living more dense and living in cities will help us fight climate change and will be better for the climate in the long run, that it's not a bad thing with urbanization? Or, or has that view changed somewhat lately? Would it be better if more people could live in the countryside, less, consum less high consumption lifestyles, etc.? What, what's your view on that? City life versus countryside life? Who's the question directed to? Sandra? Oh, I can't give a simple answer to that, <laughs> I think. Uh, I mean, the, um, the concept of the um, um, compact city has uh, it's, uh, questioned. Uh, I mean, as much as it's uh, uh, talked about as a uh, way forward, I, I think it's also, it also brings, um, not least, I would say, pressure on... Uh, who is taking place in the city. I think this uh, uh, example of uh, where children should play in the city is quite uh, interesting, where we, sh we see that in, in many cases in uh, planning Sweden at least, the um, social um, care, social service come in quite late in the planning process. We tend to focus uh, first on housing. So we, then we get a lot of people into um, a new place being built and then we start planning for the uh, children care a little um, more later. And what happens is that um, this is kind of being, um, how do you say, co compromised away. But <laughs> less children, less uh, space for children, that's what I'm, I'm trying to say. That is uh, one example, but I mean there is uh, a uh, lot of um, conflicts, I guess, going on. I think we move to the next. It's uh, 
My name is Eric Bova, and um, I'm asking about uh, revolution or what kind of obstacles that occur if we try to go too fast to reach the sustainable city. Uh, what, what was that obvious? Uh, uh, did you? Uh, Obstacles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we want to be there now. Yeah. Stephanie? Um, I'm not sure I think about it in terms of obstacles, but I guess maybe one of the, the things that I tend to think about are that we're um, emphasizing technological solutions to sustainability. And um, this comes at a price when you're thinking about the social aspect of cities. So. We may be putting, uh, we may be developing cities very rapidly. We're making all kinds of really cool um, new harbors that are having all kinds of low emission buildings, um, and and I think also we ha we tend to focus on low um, achieving uh, zero or low emissions cities, uh, but there are actually socioeconomic impacts to this, and I think that that we in the future. Uh, maybe not so far in the future, but I think that we will see these as some of the problems of moving too fast with technical technological solutions. Uh, Matthias wanted to give a response to that as well. I love your question because some of the places I've, g I've gone to were which are being perceived as the most sustainable cities. The, be it the Millennium Cities, you know, the Jeffrey Sachs Initiative, or be it Master in, in, in the United Arab Republic, are disasters because they, they don't interact with the rest of the society. They're just for people like us, and basically they're only environmentally sustainable. All the other aspects of sustainability that you brought up are simply not there, and that just means that there's no reproduction effects. We built these model cities because that's where we want to learn from, but nobody wants to learn from it because it's not something that people feel included in. So I guess the old saying that if you want to go far, you need to go together, it really holds true in this aspect as well. Hello, my name is Christopher Freiberg. I'm from a Swedish research company called Energiotech. I would like to offer an answer to the lady question about can cities be sustainable? My simple answer is probably not no. It's a, que it's a question of definition. But if we take an example of a relatively small city like Stockholm and what is going on here, I'm quite worried about the development here. Uh, the way how we urbanize Stockholm now uh, is not a sustainable way when it comes to incineration plants being built inside the city, uh, the way how we build our buildings, the way how we plan our infrastructure. So there is very many great challenges here. I'm also traveling a lot in Sweden and internationally, and everywhere I go in small cities, I see new chimneys popping up everywhere. People are burning things, uh, burning things which should be used as raw material to produce new things instead. The, the, the forerunners <coughs> in sustainability today are some of those cities that Stephanie mentioned, but also look at islands. Islands are like isolated mini uh, uh, citizenships, and they are really driving the sustainability issue today. Uh, there are some few islands today that produce more renewable energy than they can consume on the island. The Orkney Islands is one extreme example. Iceland is another one. So my short answer is making cities and large cities sustainable, that's a very big challenge. We should support uh, the distribution of people inside the country. If you look at very big populated countries like India, where they have their cities distributed, it's an absolute necessity. Otherwise, it would be gross in those mega cities. You're, you're approaching your, the time limit. Uh, was there a question in there? No. So, your neighbor uh, next to you. Okay. Thank you. My name is Lotta Samuelsson. I work for Stockholm International Water Institute. Uh, I have a question for Stephanie. Um, uh, working at uh, working with water, I'm very curious about the report this year. And does it mention at all water, water in sustainable cities? 
Whew. Um, I honestly can't think of any uh, clear examples right now. I promise you I read the whole book, but I can't think of any clear examples right now. Um, of course, there's mention of getting enough clean water to people. Um, yeah, um, in terms of, uh, uh, there may be also some mention of hydroelectric dams, but I don't have a clear example in mind right now. <laughs> okay. Yeah. In the light of climate change, there's many predictions about uh, even more scarce available of water or more water as a disaster risk. So, yeah. so uh, maybe that's a maybe water. I mean, water, uh, potable water. I can't <laughs> remember being mentioned as often. But if we're talking about um, rainwater catchment and um, climate change adaptation, for uh, I mean, uh, many cities are utilizing green infrastructure and dealing with water in that sense. So yes, there are many examples from the book in terms of that. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Hello, my name is Cecilia Wemming and I'm the CEO of a small startup uh, industry called Pop-Up House in the construction industry. And I have a question to the panel on who do you see will build these sustainable cities? Uh, we are a small startup uh, and we build like really mobile, sustainable, cool looking, high functional homes out of shipping containers. Uh, so it's really good, but we have a hard time to establish on the market because it's constructed uh, for huge companies. So even though we have a great idea, a great innova innovation, we can't survive almost because the whole system is built for big companies. So in the future, uh, is there hope for small innovative companies like us going globally, or is it the big giants that will keep on building these sustainable cities? Who will build it? Um, I, well, I guess um, we need to be all uh, um, part of building the sustainable city together, but uh, what you also is uh, like pointing at the big uh, companies having a big uh, role is uh, true, and it is also admitted as a challenge in, in many municipalities that also see that it's important to bring in smaller companies and I know that uh, at least um, Gothenburg and I, I, I guess uh, many municipalities all over Sweden and also other Nordic countries are uh, trying to uh, approach smaller companies and make it more possible for them to be part of the planning processes, which takes lo lots of, of resources and, and time, of course. But I think that uh, your initiative and what you're doing is um, interesting for... Um, I know, and yet uh, in the nearest two weeks we might shut down, because it's so hard to establish mm. on this market. Matthias? I think, first of all, Stephanie made an important remark when you started out, uh, saying that most of the buildings here are really old. So if we're going to reach a sustainable city, and yes, we have to, because uh, there's no way around it since most people are living in cities, we can't wait for new buildings. Because most of the buildings that were already built before we were born are the ones we're going to live in until we die. So most of the answer is to fix what's already there. And that is more natural, that it can be many different small companies. Now, for building the new buildings, I think it's very important, first of all, to change the logic, because when I go to Nordbyg the other week, for instance, and I understand how they're being paid. They're being paid by the lowest cost per square meter. And of course, that's if that's the way you're being paid, you're not going to build very sustainable. So change what you're paying for, and then also make sure that you divide those huge buildings, 100,000 buildings, to separate blocks so that you can come in with offers. Whether your offer is sound or not, I don't know, but small companies are of course important because they're going to be the new big ones. Um, my name is Peter Lindros. I'm working at Urban Minds and we are working at a project at present where we are trying to define uh, a city at the cutting edge of urban sustainability. So it's quite um, inspiring to be here. I have a question. Um, uh, what do you in the panel think, where are we at the closest, which aspect of cities are we at the closest of uh, uh, reaching sustainability and which aspect are we the furthest away from reaching sustainability? That would be quite interesting aspects to hear about. Uh, is anyone in particular to answer that? that? Who 
who will grab that question? Very brief answer. We're closest in Sweden when it comes to heating and electricity. We're almost all green. We're the furthest away and we're not even moving in the right direction when it comes to a participatory approach. That's what I think. Um, what, what, sorry, what did you say in the end? <laughs> I don't think, when it comes to participatory approach, uh -huh. getting people involved, I don't think we're moving in the right direction, apart from a few nice examples. Uh -huh. I think it's also, I just would add that it's really context uh, dependent, because living in Copenhagen, to me it appears that we're quite close in transportation. But that doesn't hold in a lot of places, so. Um, I mean, it's interesting because I think in um, comparison, I mean, Nordic uh, cities are like exporting solutions on uh, building sustainable uh, cities. So I think that um, in um, that we are at least uh, looked as be having lots of interesting uh, solutions. But I think that uh, was it you mentioned in the beginning also this uh, like exp that we are also exporting. Uh, Emissions, or I mean that uh, emissions are produced in in other places, and that we are uh, among, even though we rank very high in in uh, uh, low energy consumption in some ways, and uh, these uh, sustainability um, um, factors, we also are still <laughs> among the biggest consumers uh, in the world. And I think we need to be very aware of that all the time, and not just, even though we have many solutions that other countries are uh, interested in. in in, I mean, for example, uh, even though we might complain about the possibilities of biking in Stockholm, I think that uh, in comparison with uh, other countries where you can't uh, bike at all in the city, it's uh, looked, uh, seemed as being um, innovative in this um, direction. But we need to stay uh, conscious about the, the back parts of it as well. A comment about the urbanization questions. And, and you are? Magnus Persson, Municipal Commissioner for the Centre Party, Solna. So what many of the things I will mention apply to Matthias as well. He lives a few blocks away from me. I think the relevant question is not is the city sustainable, but is it more sustainable than the countryside? I've lived on, in the countryside as well. I didn't have this strategy with 99.6% renewables. I did not bike to work. I did not have efficient ventilation systems in my building. So you were, were not living sustainably? <laughs> no. S uh, yeah. Are countryside living more sustainable than city living? Anyone? Christina. <laughs> no. Maybe one thing I can say, I in the book it's also mentioned as well, um, this, this notion of economic agglomeration. So that cities tend to be centers of um, uh, businesses and people, of uh, the centers where businesses and people are producing a lot of innovation together. And so in that sense, if you want to think about sustainable solutions, let's say being produced rapidly, perhaps, I'm just saying perhaps, I'm not sure, that um, cities may be one place where we, we see um, these uh, solutions being implemented more rapidly. But it's not exactly an answer to your question. Do you want the last word, Sandra? Because um. if not, <laughs> no, I'm going to no, close. I've seen several hands. Uh, you may ask those questions and you may continue to discuss, but it will be after we close this panel. There are, uh, we, have, we serve some fika back there. People are welcome to stay for a while. Uh, and, but I'd like to thank the panel, or at least Sandra and Stephanie, for coming here. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm supposed to be here, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And, uh, and to all, all the rest, you're welcome back uh, at our next seminar. Do we know what seminar is coming up next? Well, we do know. One thing we, we, that we do know is that we have a very full Almedana schedule. So for those of you at Almedana, and we know that the Almedana mingle Monday evening about sustainable transport, which is an important part of, of sustainable cities, uh, that's going to be limited to 150. Last year we were 350, so if you think that you want to be part of those 150 letters,